Alex, welcome back to the show. How are you? How are things? What's happening in the world? I am great, actually. I'm, I'm much better than I have any uh, than I really deserve to be, having flown twenty hours back from Australia. But I've yeah. I appear to have weathered it weirdly well. No um, so. You know, I'll be the first to complain if I was jet lagged to 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 nothingness. But I've actually I've actually done well this time, so I'm celebrating that. Excellent. Well done, you. Was it fun in Australia? Really was. Yeah, love Albert Park. Love the people. Love the vibe. It's a different thing. I'd never been to Australia before, like even as a tourist. Um, so to go there and have the opportunity to go there for a, for a Formula One weekend was was fabulous. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a lovely place to go. Now, let's get straight into it. You have, as everyone knows, an affinity with historic racing cars. Before we come on to the very exciting news that you've released fairly recently, what is it about these historics that you love so much? Uh, I just, I love racing as it was, partially because there was so much more development to go, right? So you look at these cars and you think they're massively imperfect. You know, they're, they're, they're rubbish, by modern standards they're absolutely <laughs> rubbish but that rubbishness um comes with a brilliance as well in terms of the drama of them uh, you know uh, the 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 scalpel like efficiency of a modern racing car means that there's very little sound coming out of it uh, in comparison because all the sound a race car creates is ra- wasted energy and the modern cars use all that energy to go forwards and you don't see them go sideways and move around because of course that's wasted energy and the modern cars use all that energy to go forwards. So everything we love about racing cars has, has been kind of slowly edited out to a degree over the years uh, uh, and old race cars put all of that back in again, as well as leaving a big space in their competence. And I like a big space in their competence because it's a big space that as the driver, I can fill and go, yeah, I can make it do that when it's not supposed to do that. And and I can chalk that up to, you know, Alex can drive. It would, would give myself lots of Alex can drive points around making it do that. So yeah. that's what I love about historic race cars. And Alex can drive historic race cars. And I, presumably it's not something that everyone can do. I mean, can, can you, as for someone who's never driven a historic race car, can they switch from a modern day, very, as you say, sort of, you know, pinpoint accurate, modern day race car can they easily switch into historic and not be as quick as your good self of course but hold their own or or even or even quicker or even quicker um it's so weird because it's so personal you know you see drivers jump across um drivers with a mechanical mindset do really well uh drivers who have driven you know one chassis engine combination through their full junior single seater career don't do as well um i mean the big challenge for the the youth of the youth of today uh is that they um they don't do stick shift anymore I, i'm probably the last um the last generation of single seater racer to drive an h pattern shift single seater with a dog box in it so that's yeah. a massive advantage but you know uh to name a, a you know rob huff is outstanding just been reannounced in the british touring car championship jake hill is extremely good and then drivers like andre lotterer are, are just excellent they're sort of the the older sports car guard uh, i won't be unkind enough to name some drivers that have really struggled but there are some drivers world championship winning drivers that have broken gearboxes in three corners. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm, not, I, I'm not surprised to hear it. I mean, it must be hugely challenging. I've never had a go really. The closest I've got, I think was um, probably a stick shift at uh, Palmer sports and where, where I've, you know, driven around there in, in relatively modern cars, but you know, at least with an old fashioned, you know, gear lever that you have to throw around. And, um, and quite frankly, I was useless, but, this has all led to something. So you, you've got this this um, affinity with these cars, as we've said. That's led to something tremendously exciting. Brundle Motorsport, which must sound amazing. Tell us all about it. How, why, who, when, w- what caused this to happen? So me with a lot of cars, mostly. Um, but <laughs> the, the, the aim of it is obviously you get some, some great racing. I mean, uh, incredible racing, uh, you know, 20 GT40s up Eau Rouge happens every September. And and there are a, a group of people who know about this racing and, and it is and it's big, you know, people attending at the racetrack. But it's not really broadcast, yeah. you know, 
uh, and the more I see about uh, motorsport broadcasting and the more uh, time I spend kind of with the weird helicopter view of racing that, ge- that, that being involved in motorsport broadcasting gives you, the more I think, you know, I, I hear people say, I want these cars to move around. I want them to be loud. I want them to be fast. And the more I make the connection that actually a lot of things that the motorsport audience want are happening right now in historic racing. Someone just needs to shine a light on it. Simultaneously, you know, historic motorsport uh, is it a crossover point, and it's a very interesting crossover point based around the inevitable mortality of human beings. That yeah. there are now a group of people who are in love with these cars, and the reason they're in love with these cars is because race cars of the fifties and you know, people kind of my dad's age, you know, race cars of the fifties and mid sixties. They watch them racing as they grew up and they remember them, right? So they've kept these race cars running because they really wanted to drive them when they were 15. And now they've got the opportunity to drive them by hook or by crook and they've, uh, and they race them. But there will come a time where those people are unable to race those cars anymore. And they are not, you know, either armed to do so or old or passed on or whatever. So historic racing needs. Uh, you know, sort of the other side of the other side of the deal, if you like, is that historic racing needs a new generation to be resold these racing cars on the basis that they're fast and loud and awesome as they are. Movies like Le Mans 66 do such a brilliant job of that, but we need to keep on doing it. Otherwise, they'll all get thrown in a shed and just rot themselves to bits, which would be tragic considering the fact that the audience, when they see this stuff, and I've got the numbers to prove it, love this stuff you know um so how do we sort that out because i i mean when i was growing up i watched formula one generally obviously because of the teams and formula one's probably a bit of an exception here you you get real hardcore team fans as much as you do the driver but for me it's it's a lot about the driver and i have my favorite drivers I have to admit, I'm not au fait with historic racing yet. This will probably, you know, start tuning me into it a little bit. But is it about the people who are driving those historic cars and, and getting younger people behind the wheel? Is that one way we're going to try and, you know, ramp it up a little bit? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, yeah, firstly, getting younger people behind the wheel. Secondly, you know, there is an amazing, amazing innovation called the internet, and it's where a new generation do their viewing, they do their televisioning, they do their buying, they do their selling. So, you know, I am kind of in a sweet spot age where uh, I can drive and uh, and I'm interested in these cars, but also like sort of the first era of racing driver really to sort of discover the power of, of of being able to reach everyone in the world instantly, you know? And I, I honestly think that if the internet had existed in 1965, motorsport would have probably been the biggest sport in the world. In fact, if the internet had existed in 1965, motorsport would probably be banned by now because yeah. because people could see yeah. how extreme and how unbelievable and, and how vicious those cars are. So, but I think by by sort of communicating that using the tools that we have today to to sell the cars that we had yesterday you can get a a, a very long way so as uh, Jamie Chadwick is on a sort of one woman crusade to get women's racing more into the limelight and more bums on seats is this Alex Brundle on a on a one man crusade to bring historic racing into the front of everyone's minds yeah, I think I think it's fair to call it a crusade. I think it's it's I think it's a valid plight, you know. Uh, uh, and also, kind of looking at things ecologically as much as anything. I mean, it's not the most ecological pursuit, but trying to push forward the 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 forum of things like sustainable fuels as an option moving into the future. You know, kind of say say things like yes, I understand that. Uh, you know, we can move forward in terms of our fueling technologies and our energy technologies. But even still, the most ecological car available in the marketplace today is the car that already exists that you don't have to build. Yeah. Does that mean you have to go and buy a 1961 Corvette C1? No, it doesn't. But it's still something worth communicating. Uh, And uh, I just 
I love race cars. This encapsulates everything I love about race cars. And I think that it's worth communicating to a new generation to see if they feel the same. Yeah, absolutely. And Brundle Motorsport as as an entity supported by Adrian Flux. Yes. It, so so what's the setup there? So are you now effectively a team boss and driver and will have other drivers racing for you? Correct. So over the years in the World Endurance Championship, I, I've driven for multiple teams where, I mean, think, think of it as sort of Tolman Endstone, uh, Benetton Endstone, Alpine Endstone. I'm doing a kind of a, a similar thing. So we organize, we promote, um, but there are a group of people who know how to run and operate these cars. And it would be incredibly silly of me to go, you know what, all of you, I, I can do a better job than you. Um, and so I'm just going to go out on my own, set up a workshop. Alex Brundle and a spanner tries to run an E-type Jag, not very smart. So we're collaborating in the industry to try to use the kind of expertise of those people to to run these cars. And then I'm doing what I'm good at, which is communicating the racing. We're inviting a, a load of different guests along that go across the eras of motorsport. So some drivers that the uh, the kind of uh, traditionalist racing fans uh, will be across. For example, we've got David Brabham driving for us at, at the Goodwood members meeting. Some drivers that will be entirely uh, familiar to the new generation, YouTubers, you know, Instagram stars uh, and people like that to try to get the broadest possible appeal uh, for the for the championship, um, for the for the team that we can. Uh, and we're going to race four cars o- over the year, over some of the biggest racing festivals across you know, the UK and Europe with guest drivers behind the wheel. I'm properly throwing them at the cars and saying, have a go in that. See yeah. how you get on. We're insuring it. Please try not to crash it. But, you know, le- let's see. I'm sure some of them are going to be outstandingly wildly brilliant. I'm sure some of them are going to be struggle a little bit more but that's going to be the joy and the fun of it yeah i'm already shitting myself slightly at the prospect of someone (laughs) crashing one of those very lovely cars talking of which can you pinpoint a favorite what's your favorite classic car to take on track uh so i drove in the middle of last year and anybody who's been following uh our our progress um will know will be able to say which car i'm going to say immediately but i drove a 512m ferrari which is the Anybody likes the original Le Mans movie by Steve McQueen, you've obviously got the 917 Porsche. The 512M Ferrari is the other one. Yeah, it's the Ferrari that they're racing against. Um, it's a V12, um, often often mistaken for a flat 12, but it's a V12. And it, you know, you push the throttle down and it sounds like the earth is rotating backwards. The car is not going forward. <laughs> it is just full on, you know, full on, full on bit of machinery. Okay, second part to that question. Where would you take it? Favourite track? Uh, So I've been begging and pleading uh, to to take it to the Le Mans Classic because I I just want to hear it. I just want to hear it in fifth gear, pulling pulling down the Montan. But, I mean, I I have have raced at the Le Mans Classic and I don't think I've ever been so frightened in my life, frankly. It it was just... The the, the, the thing is that this kind of racing, people kind of look at it and go it's just you know a load of sort of kind of tweedy blazer brigade hanging out with their cars man it is the most extreme stuff yeah like i can imagine but this but this is the challenge isn't it that's the perception that that people like you have got to change and and let's hope it does it let's turn our attention to formula one um you're doing you're a busy boy you're not only doing all the I am loving it. I am loving it. Um, it's incredibly busy from the start of the weekend. I mean, I, I called 72 drivers, um, you know, uh, over over the line uh, in, in Melbourne because you know, you've got Formula 3, which is 30, then Formula 2, then then F1. So it, it's, it's wildly, wildly busy. But, you know, I get a view of the whole picture of the whole F1 weekend. There's not a huge amount of downtime. Uh, I need to be really careful that... So the content I put out there, as you'll know really well, um, there's always it's the it's the content iceberg, isn't it? What goes out versus what you have to know to be able to say what goes out in the moment. So you've got to manage your time really well. Um, But it's uh, but it's a joy to 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 be able to talk to so many people as well over the weekend across uh, both networks that I that I talk to. So that's great. 
And what do you think is the current health of Formula One? There's been loads of controversy lately. We all know about it. We don't need to cover that stuff off in, in any detail. But broadly speaking, from a sporting perspective, how do you look at the health of the sport? I mean, I'm coming off one of the most, well, no, the most attended F1 Grand Prix of all time. You know, yeah, so that, that that speaks for itself in a way. Um, viewer figures are are good. The, the health of the sport is good. Uh, and, I, and I think, you know, you've got a fan base now who uh, interest is meeting depth of knowledge in a, in a way which is is much more than I think over previous years. You, you know, I, I think when the, the drive to survive boom in terms of Formula One interest happened, everybody kind of went, yep, amazing. But those fans, I wonder if they're going to turn into enthusiasts beyond beyond being fans. And I think the conversion rate from sort of casual fan to enthusiast is certainly greater than I expected. And and the the depth of knowledge and interest of those fans and and how much they demand from the broadcast and from the sport is uh, is is huge as well. We've got to work really hard as broadcast and uh, as broadcasters and as a sport um to to service that fan base and make sure we keep f1 interesting i manage a roster of could get a bit more exciting throughout the rest of the year it wasn't necessarily a clean weekend for red bull by any means are we starting to see some chinks in the armor there do you think i think so i mean it's an interesting one The, the qualifying data showed that the ferrari is really good in the medium speed so it's going to be you know, the Red Bull's still efficient at, at, at top line speed. You can see that everywhere they drive. There's a few there's a few kilometers per hour in the very highest speed sections. But what the Ferrari does have is uh, just that kind of medium speed and also compliance. So bumpy circuits, circuits with a, a sequences of medium speed corners. I think we're going to see the Ferrari challenge definitely on qualifying day. Uh, science was... You know, on in terms of lap speed, faster than Verstappen uh, in qualifying. He made a mistake in turns nine and ten. Um, you know, kind of understandably, considering he'd, he'd missed the last race and had his appendix out and was racing with significant pain. Man, that was impressive. But yeah, yeah, it, he, he, you know, as a fact, there was an error uh, in, in turn nine and ten. Um, so they should have started on pole. Uh, I think. Over Leclerc was unfortunate, um, losing the final lap as well. So, you know, you could easily have had a Fer- all Ferrari front row there, um, which would have been which would have been a great race. Um, Perez uh, spoke to me after qualifying and, and talked a lot about tire degradation for the Red Bull on the softer compounds of tire, which Pirelli seemed to be trending towards more and more. So, I think all of those factors together. Uh, uh, give us, yeah, a Ferrari versus Red Bull battle with a sort of McLaren versus an on-form Mercedes or an on-form Aston Martin uh, battle behind that. Now, I'm really keen to get your take on this. So I've been having some debates online with various fans about the Hamilton departure to Ferrari and the motivations behind it. Not necessarily, well, sporting, I suppose. He's going for driving reasons, obviously, but there's a lot of money uh, involved. He's on a big salary already, something like $50 million a year. He's going over there to something what's rumoured to be $80 million plus $20 million for his foundation. What do you think is his motivation for going? Is it purely sporting and seeing a car that's developing and an eighth world championship? Is it money driven? Is it a combination of all the above? Is it about his his foundation? How do you see it? I mean, I, I think humans are more, you know, especially sports people who've been in sport a long time are more complex than a sort of a, a binary, a binary. It's because of that. It's because of this. I mean, you know, offer to double anyone's money, you know, whether you're making whether you're making 200 quid a day and are offered 400 quid or you're making 50 million and are offered 100 doesn't really matter, does it? Of, or, you know, offer to double someone's money. It's an incentive. Um, clearly, Mercedes is not performing. There's an element of frustration there. I, I think Melbourne was probably one of the most frustrating weekends for Mercedes because they didn't even show the early promise in the weekend that they have throughout the rest of the season. Um it, it it's it's a bit of all of the above i think uh you know to to say that it's only about the the sporting side of things 
I, I, I mean, I think human nature is different to that, right? We, we all want to do as well as we can out of sport, you know, out of life, out of, you know, so uh, to, to drive in red is a dream of all race car drivers as well. That's clearly a factor. The money's clearly a factor. And to have a car which is capable of performing, which it clearly is, is a factor. I mean, I think Lewis uh, and management are, are quite good at the chess game. You know, if you look at his jump from McLaren to Mercedes, that was timely. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, yeah. Absolutely. And, and I suppose <clears throat> the interesting part of it as well is the whole Carlos Sainz piece, because, you know, as you say, as you've hinted out there, he did an absolutely astonishing job um, in Australia, particularly after his operation, you know, something like 12 or 13 days before he was literally lying there um, being cut open. Um, so where does this leave him? And do you think there'll be occasions where Ferrari think, oh, crap. I wish we had Carlos back in the car at this track. Yeah, I mean it's it's really impressive from from Carlos. Um, I I feel sorry for him in the scenario because I don't I don't think he's necessarily underperformed. Um, and yeah, you, looking into the future, is there an option at Red Bull there? I mean that would be victory from the jaws of defeat, wouldn't it? Um, mm -hmm. If they continue their their run of form. You've got to remember, though, as well, there's not actually that when you get start getting into 2025, there's not actually that long till the next regulation set. So, um, yeah, anything any of them do is a gamble, you know, to the to the next set of regulations, you know, presuming it's a, a, a multi-year contract um, to the next set of regulations. Yeah. RB could be dominant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's a, a, perhaps perhaps a, as the a sort of the Red Bull junior team, if you like, perhaps a bad call. But McLaren could put together yeah. an outstanding, you know, car to the next set of regs, and Oscar Piastri could be multiple world champion or Lando Norris. So, yeah, yeah it, it, it's always a gamble. But I, I think the best option for science will be will be to Red Bull. That yeah. being said, you know. Perez is not underperforming either. You know, in the early phase of this year, it was a bit more of a difficult Grand Prix in Melbourne, but I think he's found consistency. And I don't think there's, I don't think there's necessarily great justification to sort of, you know, do anything with Sergio or immediately replace Sergio given his performance in the early phases of the year. And what about Haas? Because I, I, I like Haas. I've always liked Haas. I love, I love an underdog. And um, I think they've surprised everybody, haven't they? Is this just a case of some top quality defensive driving on occasion? Or is this a car that has actually got some potential? No, it's got potential. I mean, when you look at the um, average lap performance, uh, I haven't looked at it yet from Melbourne, but when you look at it from Singapore, I'm um, sorry, Singapore, Saudi Arabia, um, it's because I came back home via Singapore, <laughs> melted in the brain. Uh, when, you, when you look back at Saudi Arabia, um, it was Nico Hülkenberg just behind Lewis Hamilton in terms of average lap speed in the house. So, wow. Um, yeah, I spoke to K-Mag at the end of last year, uh, and he said, the, the reason we have so much tire degradation is the car doesn't perform in combined load. So it doesn't brake and turn, uh, it doesn't accelerate and turn, which means you end up slipping the tire across the track and you and you get this kind of horrible tire degradation. Um, but, you know, it kind of, it, it seems that they've managed to fix that now. Hulkenberg's still a, a one-lap machine um, and, and very, very good. You know, he's lapping Bahrain, uh, at the beginning of the year was one of the most exceptional qualifying laps I've ever seen. Super, super crisp. So uh, they seem to have race pace and, you know, new management there, which is very practical management as well. Can't be hurting either. Now, um, Danny Rick. So uh, what is going on with him? I mean, he's as, he seems as perplexed as anybody with his performance and is, is standing there watching his teammate go through the qualifying sessions and looking fairly bemused at the the times that he's he's able to get it, what is going on is the, is this just the natural end of of Danny Rick or or do you think there's some fight left in him I mean there's always there's always fight left you look at Fernando I mean you know you can't you can't you can't age drivers out of formula 1 anymore with Fernando still performing um it, it could be an element of underestimation i think of the of the challenge when he when he went back i think he thought uh, you know you look across the garage at sonoda you look at some of the moments that that yuki's had and i think daniel um as a driver thought yeah i'm clear of all of that like i'm gonna well i'm gonna waltz in and i'm gonna be the dominant 
be the dominant driver here. I think it's also sort of, there was a lot of discussion uh, last year. There's been a lot of movement around the second seat there, you know, drivers in, drivers out. I think Sonoda's had kind of a time where the focus has been off him to actually focus in. And I think he's performing really well, Yuki. Um, you know, he's a great driver by all accounts and he's not somebody you just waltz in and beat. Um, and I think without spotlight on him, he's been slowly creeping up on it. And actually now has been more of a force across the garage than, than Ricardo perhaps expected when he took the seat. Yeah. Now, before we come on to the future, I want to get your take on this. I love putting people on the spot like this. If you were the team boss, and who knows, one day you might be if you carry on with this. Uh, Rundle Motorsport team... to Formula <laughs> One, confirmed. Oh, it's, it's got a ring to it. <laughs> yeah. Heard it here, folks. Uh, who would be your dream F1 driver lineup and which team boss would you hire? And take it, and that's from a sort of recent era, I suppose. It doesn't necessarily have to be drivers on the grid right now, but the recent era. <sighs> Uh, team boss, I don't know. I mean, it's. Uh, I have. I think I would. I would do it differently. I mean, you know, in terms of team principle, they're such a figurehead. Um, but you know, when you look at the quality, I, I, I see it every couple of weekends because McLaren do an excellent strategic briefing in front of Andrea Stella, and uh, the quality of his understanding of everything that's going on and, and his preparation of the team for for the challenge of a race day you know you you come in hot on race day and you and you kind of see the preparation that's occurred and it's it's wildly impressive like mm -hmm. wildly impressive so i think i would have him at the helm uh, of, of the of the organization you know in terms of a figurehead I mean, yeah, cool. Send someone to chat to the media. It's the, it's the, you know, it's the nuts and bolts that really matter. Yeah. Two drivers I'd have. I mean, Verstappen is 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 still for me the class of the field. Um, I think probably Verstappen and Norris are the two that I would pick at this stage if I was going to go into a if I was going to go into a, a race uh, next year. It would be a it would be a kind of tie between Norris and Leclerc uh yeah. at this stage um yeah, yeah. Uh, solid yeah yeah it would be interesting to see someone like norris against verstappen and equal machinery wouldn't it i'd love to see a bit of that now let's turn our attention to the future what's the grand plan for you personally like what happens next you've got a lot going on at the moment you've got you sort of booming and growing broadcasting career you've got the race team put yourself in 10 or 15 years time where are you going to be i've got no idea absolutely really abs <laughs> absolutely none there's, there's no grand plan no i mean I think that I don't, I don't think you can really have a grand plan. You know, I, I still race. I'm, I'll be racing the VLN this year. The NLS, we're supposed to call it. That's that's you know an N24. Um, I, I guess sort of comms in the front, race team in the back. You know, and uh, and work and work on all of that kind of thing. I think uh, mostly I'm just focused on the moment in the, in the moment and making sure that the audience that I speak to are reassured that I, you know, I, I'd like to be the person and I've, I've kind of used this analogy a couple of times, you know, when you see, when a nature show comes on television and uh, somebody speaks other than David Attenborough, you kind of sit there and go, you kind of sit there and go, okay, I'm prepared to watch a bit of this, but I was, I was kind of really hoping it would be David Attenborough. <laughs> That's you exactly know? what you mean. It, it and and over time, and I'm sure it will take time. Um, I, I really hope to be kind of like that um, to to a motorsport audience, where a motorsport audience would hear you and go, "I know that Alex has done his preparation, is you know understanding what's going on, has done enough racing to talk, you know, cohesively and understandably about this, and as as grown as a presenter in a way where I know it's going to be explained to me in a way I understand. And if I could reach that place sort of in that kind of time period where it's like you open up the broadcast, it's the world endurance, it's formula one, it's the world endurance champion or something. And then all of a sudden, uh, and then, you know, I can rock up and the audience go, ah, all right. Okay, fine. Yeah. You I'm know, comfortable with this. that would yeah. be, that would be lovely. And that would be some, that was kind of really like it, from a media standpoint, the only thing I'm aiming for, like, it doesn't really, uh, you know, it's not, 
in the shape of like a certain position or do I want to like grow to become the leader of a certain, but no, I, I don't. And yeah, with the race team, I have no idea. Like I, I, I love spending time around race cars. Um, it's a vehicle for me to continue to do that. And also, you know, if the professional drives dry up, you know, I'm at a lower level, uh, it must be said, than I was, you know, in, in the car previously. I used to be world endurance championship level, didn't work out financially. So now in GT cars, um, but if that eventually dries up completely, it's a vehicle for me to be able to continue continue driving and being around race cars in a sort of, uh, you know, in a professional way. So those two things, I, I think, are, are the future for me. Very good. I mean, it's do, it's, do you ever dream? Like, are there moments where you think, oh, this this whole you know team management thing is pretty cool like that i wonder if i could climb the ladder and you know end up being at the very pinnacle of motorsport in formula 1 running a team i mean is that beyond the realms of possibility for you do you think i mean you got to start somewhere right we're running a load of we're running a load of historics now on a on a program on a program with with our sponsors like yeah but you know i've been really heartened by the number of people who've come out of the woodwork and gone, will you run this? Will you run that? How about this? How about that? We'd like to sponsor you. We'd like to be involved. And you look at the pace of growth. Um, the, you look at the pace of growth that's possible. Um, I think, though, in motorsport, I've been around uh, a lot of, uh, how best to phrase it, creative with the truth uh, teams. Um, yeah. and, and individuals and people who, you know, I, I ended up my, were trying to keep their business running and trying to be successful at, at, at all costs. And what I will never do in terms of that part of what I do is grow into a situation where I need to do that to, to keep it successful. Like I will only ever, I have my ropes, you know, and I'll only yeah. ever, you know, deal honestly and forthrightly. So I will never grow things beyond the place where I can do so with everybody being appropriately remunerated, treated with yeah. respect and, and honestly and, and everything being honestly expressed. And if that's whole, if that holds me back in that forum, then so be it. I, th I think it would do the opposite. I mean, I think that the one thing I've learned uh, that I'll be entering next year will be my 20th year in, in Formula One sponsorship and commercial. And um, and it's it, sponsorship in particular is a completely dog eat dog world. It's it's savage at times. And as you know, it's extremely challenging to get sponsorship for anything um, from F Formula One down. Um, but I probably only have six people probably in my inner circle that I actually completely and utterly trust. Mm. It is, it, and as you say, there are, there are individuals out there at companies and so on who uh, aren't always doing things in the correct manner. Um, but I've always found that, you know, treating it ethically and correctly over the long term is, is the way to go and, and will get you further. Um, you, you know, you always get found out otherwise, I find. Um, now, we have our final three. I've tweaked these slightly because we had you on the show I can't remember what it was. It's pro probably like 18 months ago or something. I'm not sure. Time flies. But we would have asked you a couple of these questions already. So I've tweaked them a little bit. First one is the same. And it'd be interesting to compare what your answer was to this the first time we had you on the show. But what's got you excited at the moment? Could be anything. Doesn't necessarily need to be racing related. Uh, what's got me excited at the moment? Uh, I Formula One, Hypercar Era Le Mans got me excited. Yeah, really. yeah, very cool. Yeah, Hypercar Era Le Mans. Uh, I I wish I was in it. Honestly, mm. I, I really do. I, I would like I would like to have been in it on a different timeline. I am in it, but that's not how it's worked out. Um, but yeah, I, I'm excited about that. I, I will be at Le Mans this year in in a, in a capacity, um, and and it's an exciting place. It's, it's an exciting yeah. place to view and witness. I like it. Um, now this is a new one ish. Uh, we've used this on a couple of people, but it's certainly new for you. What's one lesson your job has taught you that you think everyone should learn at some point in their life? Oh, this this one's super easy. So um, another broadcaster, God, uh, I can't remember who it was. One of, one of someone I look up to, I, it might, yeah, I can't remember who it was. They said to me, you know the thing you fit you're feeling really nervous and self-confident about? And, and and not self-confident about 
Yeah. Always be aware that there's someone out there doing it badly, extremely confidently. <laughs> yes, I like that. And it makes you feel instantly better because you know it's true. You know the thing that you feel the thing you feel self-conscious about, always remember there's someone else out there doing it extremely confidently and yeah. wrong. <laughs> so yeah. And you and you only feel self conscious about it because you care. And if you care, you'll do a good job. So no, that's a, I like that. I'm going to use that myself. Um, final one for you. What item could you absolutely not live without? What item could I absolutely not live without? I have a backpack. Yes. Like one of those laptop backpacks with like a million pockets. Mm, and nice. I exist from the backpack. And I'm embarrassed of the backpack. You know, to, to, to the point to the point where you like dress up for a meeting and you're wearing, you know, your shirt and your nice and your nice jacket and your like suede boots or whatever, and you Almost turn up double strapper. And I need the backpack. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise I forget stuff. So so my my rubbish horrendous daggy backpack is is the item which i which i need more than anything does it go over both shoulders oh yeah man yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. no i'm not cool enough to single strap it either <laughs> no no you can't so, you can't even sling the single strap over your head and it really no i know i need no. it i need it i go in i go in um, i'm gonna get people coming up to me going yeah there's a backpack but any gets that the yeah. backpack is and, and and equally if i changed if i changed the backpack disaster man everything oh, really oh yeah oh well that that's a show. I was actually in my head. I was thinking I'm going to buy Alex a new backpack, but th- but that's not going to happen, is it? The, this is this is your backpack for life, mate. There's, a, there's a, everybody who travels a lot, a lot has the combo. Like I say, I have the wallet with the passport sleeve in it, the yeah. backpack and the and the carry on, and they're made and they're made of pain, hardship, and and <laughs> and and deep understanding of getting it wrong over many many years. So there's the there's the magical trifecta. <laughs> Of the of the of the wallet, the bag, and the carry on that are that are everything of it that are everything you need. A little glimpse into Alex Brundle's life, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Alex, it's been great talking to you again. It's uh, I've I've missed chatting to you. We we did a, a podcast on the race for a while with Sean Kelly, and um, it's something that we've talked internally about getting back up and running. So um, watch this space, folks. But for now, Alex, thank you so much for joining us on the show, and good luck with um, Brundle Motorsport and all your other broadcasty exploits. I'll see you soon. Cheers, Tim. See you now.